Welcome to Good Day Street Talk, everybody. I'm Antoine Lewis. Let's talk performing arts. And anytime we can get a behind the scenes look at what the stars do when the lights go down, we absolutely jump on it. So, into legendary Broadway and Hollywood film producer Julian Schlossberg, whose new memoir, Try Not to Hold It Against Me, gives us an inside peek into the industry. He is here with his friend and collaborator, Academy Award winner F. Murray Abraham. I'm smiling hard now. I'll tone it down a little bit once we get into the interview, but good morning good to both morning, of you. Good morning, Antoine. How are you? <laughs> Look at him laughing. He's <laughs> <laughs> First of all, we have to congratulate both of you. We'll start with you. You said I could call you Julian. Please. You know, because writing a memoir and finding the strength and courage to go back and to revisit, you know, the good and the bad, just uh, how painstaking, if so, was it? Well, it's interesting. You, you, you know, I love that title, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And you find <laughs> out you've got to be careful with the good that you don't want to become too self-serving. And the bad, well, you got to be careful. You don't want to hurt anyone. And the ugly, you don't want to be sued. So right. you have a lot to uh, <laughs> be careful with. But I, uh, I think because of the pandemic, it was really the encouragement for me to do something rather than sit home and feel sorry for myself. I just want to go over your resume. You have been the youngest head buyer of a national theater chain, yes. VP at Paramount, founder of the independent film distributor Castle Hill Productions, which we all know produced more than 60 productions for television, Broadway, as well as film. I guess the question is, well, what haven't you done? Right. <laughs> I haven't hosted a television show on Fox. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I'll behave. <laughs> but if you're looking for a co-host. <laughs> we could do that, especially with your resume. But we, let's start at the beginning. You said I could call you Julian. Please. Uh, How did you get started? Well, it was interesting. I did didn't want to move to Los Angeles where most of the jobs were as an executive. So I decided to stay in New York and I heard about this uh, job at network television and I applied and I got the job. And that's how I started. I was 21 and I've been doing it for over 60 years. So it's a long time. And uh, you get tired some days. I'm going to bet. Yeah. We're going to bring in F. Mary Abraham, Mr. Abraham, into this conversation. He's your friend. And when memoirs come out, do you ever get worried? Did you ever say, okay, Julian, maybe not that? You know, did you offer any friendly, brotherly advice to him when he was putting this together? <laughs> no, Julian doesn't need any advice. Just plug him in and let him go, that's all. <laughs> when you read this book, I'm going to tell you, what you're going to do is you're going to want to read one chapter and you're going to want to pick up the phone and call someone and read some of it to them because it, it really is one wonderful entertaining episode after another. I'm not kidding. Okay. Will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the title of the book. Try not to hold it against me, your producer's yes. life. How'd you come up with the title, sir? When you read the book, there are a lot of people that I either worked with or consulted for that are controversial. Uh, number one was the great director, Elia Kazan. Who, of course, Baby Doll. Yeah, ba baby Doll was a <laughs> film that he and I owned together, in fact. But during the McCarthy period, he named names, as did a lot of other famous people, Jerome Robbins, Bud Schulberg, mm -hmm. Clifford Odets. But he was the most famous, and he got the most, what I'd say, bad publicity for doing that, and understandably so. I worked with Alan Klein, who was the man who managed both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. another controversial figure. And there was a young a rock and roll promoter in Buffalo who would be able to get the biggest names, if Rolling Stones or Sinatra was only doing two or three or four concerts, he'd get it, even in Buffalo. Came to me to learn the movie business, and his name was Harvey Weinstein. And then finally, the man that I really think is one of our great artists, but has terrible problems right now and reputation, is Woody Allen. Mm -hmm. And I produced many of his shows. Mm -hmm. So among those four people, you could say, maybe try not to hold it against me, to certain people. Obviously, I would work with three out of the four again. Baby Doll was controversial when it came at the out. Time. At the time. <laughs> That's Car right. Carol Baker, uh, Carl Walden, Malden, and, and Eli, Eli Wallach. Eli Wallach. Right. Very serious stuff. Then you're that close to Kazan, who's a legendary figure in this yes. industry, and you still are so young yourself. Did it not force you to maybe rethink this? Do I really want to be dealing with this? Because that was a tough time, the McCarthy era well, and everything that was going I, I on. I was ignorant. I didn't know. I had no idea about the McCarthy period with him. I knew about the McCarthy period because as a kid I watched it on television. Mm -hmm. But when I started to learn about it, yes, that was uh, something. But, you know, I mean, we 
I don't know who doesn't stumble. I know mistakes are made, and some are huge, and some are not. But I mean, there but for the grace of God, as they say. Absolutely. So, and I and I admired his artistry. I thought, and I still do think he's one of the great directors, even though I recognized what he had done was not good. Let's bring in Mr. Abraham into this conversation. Your career, certainly, uh, the awards, the, the resume, the accolades are all well earned, well deserved. And I just want to ask you your thoughts on the industry today because the industry has taken great strides to not revert back to anything close to the 50s and on American by being more inclusive. Some say that maybe they're trying too hard, but I'm just curious for a veteran like you, just your thoughts on how they are addressing diversity right now. Well, I think it's a good thing. I think sometimes you go overboard so much that people are afraid to express themselves uh, instinctively. They have, everyone starts walking on eggshells and that's not good for a creative person. But how can I complain about what's happening considering what the great success of White Lotus? I mean, really, that, it's, it's phenomenal, that fine writing and a, a wonderfully diverse cast. I the have no complaints alone. about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, and, you know, in, in Sicily. But it's not only that. I've done a couple of films that are about to come out, which uh, are very good pieces of work, so it's still possible. I just wish people weren't so ready to jump down your throat if you happen to say something that offends them because it's not meant to be offensive and i know we're all learning mm -hmm. you know those of us who are over 80. oh no <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay it's a word. lot of years left his, his word <laughs> the point is you know if you start nailing me for something that i grew up with when i was 25 years old be a little more patient with me just don't jump down my throat tell me that's all I, I object to. It becomes too strident. It becomes e both. Uh, it's you against me, me. Relax, pull back. You know, we've got too much of this red state, blue state business. And that's reflective of that. It is still called the United States of America. Isn't mm -hmm. it? It's time we pull together. Let me ask you both this. I want to ask you your thoughts on something that Mr. Abraham just said, talking about things that could perhaps have been appreciated in their time, but you try to do that today, whether it's a show like All in the Family or uh, uh, The Jeffersons, uh, you know. In the heat of the night, when it came out in 68, Rod Steiger, Sidney Poitier, uh, Black, White, North, South, you know, right at the peak of the Civil Rights Movement, could In the Heat of the Night be made today and still go on to win Best Picture and Best Actor? Well, I think this is the man to ask that question. Well, well let him start. I, I, believe, I believe it could go on today, it might be hard to win Best Picture. <laughs> but uh, it was two terrific performances, and mm -hmm. it was very important at that time, as was Sidney Poitier as a star. Uh, and yes, we, what Murray said is right. I mean, we have to get better. But sometimes, as they say, the pendulum goes too far the other way. Just tell us again the title and where can people find the book, Mr. Try, it's called Try Not to Hold It Against Me, A Producer's Life. It's uh, Amazon and at bookstores. Yeah. Terrific. Terrific. Uh, Continued success to both of you. Don't be strangers. Neither of you, all right? You'll come back and see us. Whenever you ask. <laughs> okay, we could talk to them forever, but we have to take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Okay, so we're going to go from entertainment to now talk health in specific. We're talking about colon cancer and colon screening. It's a problem particularly among men, but also impacts women as well. Here to talk more about that is Dr. Cynthia Quino, gastroenterologist at Gastroenterology Associates of Brooklyn. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I've always heard, you know, about when you're supposed to, you know, start taking this seriously and we all think that we're invincible but what just from an expert at what age should we make sure that we are really on top of this doctor so i think where the confusion comes about is that um, in the 90s uh, there seems to be an uptick in the number of patients with colon cancer who are less than the age of 60. so in 2001 they changed the screening guidelines from 50 to 45. so now everyone gets screened at 45. That's when it impacted me, uh, and I, my, I'll be honest, my reaction was like, wait, I'm too young. Wait, right, don't I right. have like another 15 years right, or something? Right, you know, right. Like now, you now, know. Yeah. But no, this is a very serious issue. Now, is, is, did they lower it because, like you were saying, the cases were coming in I don't want to say extraordinarily high, but significantly uh, enough. Signif yeah, significantly high enough to make an impact. So um, there's a lot of 
younger people with colon cancer now and we're just trying to figure out exactly what's going on. What signs should we look for, uh, doctor? I, I want to be clear that with screening, usually it's an asymptomatic average risk person that goes for screening at the age of 45. Okay. No matter what age you are, if you have symptoms, you should definitely get checked. That's a different thing. Okay. So the symptoms that we're looking for, blood parectum, any change in your bowel habits, abdominal pain, weight loss that you haven't intended, and anemia that's not well explained. So when we talk about who is affected, can you just break down the demographics for us? Sure, we always sure. associate it mostly with men. You know, right. I even came out of the gate ready to say, men, listen up. But right, no, right. You, you reminded me. You're right. like, no, 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 women too. Right, so men have a, a slightly higher incidence than women do, but it's about, it's almost about the same. And with regards to groups that are dispropor disproportionately affected, mm -hmm. um, men, uh, black men, black men and women, but black men seem to have a uh, higher incidence and also die more frequently um, from colon cancer compared to other groups. With other diseases and illnesses that are specifically attached to the black population, mm -hmm. uh, growing up generationally, we always hear, oh, it's what you eat, is, is this. Sure, How sure. much does food and, and diet play a part in this? A lot, a lot. So diets that are high in animal fat, meat uh, tend to increase your risk for colon cancer as well as alcohol intake and tobacco use so lifestyle and diet are very important genetics also? genetics also plays a role about uh, 15 to 25 percent of Americans who have colon cancer do have a family history but that leaves 75 to 80 percent of people who have no family history whatsoever who are the majority of people in the United States who are getting colon cancer so genetics plays a role but you should not use that as an excuse not to get screened. So you can't say, I don't have anyone in my family who doesn't have colon cancer, so I don't need screening. That's not the case at all. So let's say the screening takes place. Uh -huh. uh, is it a blood sample, urine, or a uh, uh other sample? Or? Okay, so there's there's a few tests out there. Um, we always say the best test is the one that gets done, but the gold the gold standard uh, test is the colonoscopy, and that is a test in which you're, you're sedated. Um, they use a long, flexible tube with a camera and a light at the end, insert it into the anus while you're asleep, mm -hmm. and examine the whole colon. It's both diagnostic and therapeutic in that we can remove polyps um, at the same time. And the polyps are what can grow, become larger, change, and become colon cancers. So once a polyp is determined, the, it's tested mm -hmm. to see if it's cancerous or... So there's different types of polyps. Okay. Yeah, so uh, usually adenomatous polyps and sessile serrated polyps, those are the types that have the potential to become colon cancers. And so that's essentially what we're looking for and we remove those during the procedure. And that, of course, de decreases your risk for colon cancer. We always think cancer and clusters of cells. So if someone has these polyps that you right. said that uh -huh. you're looking for and they turn out, you know, hopefully to not be cancerous, is the potential for, since the polyps grew in the first place, for more to grow? Yes, so if you are a polyp maker, yes, there's a tendency that you may regrow new polyps. And so um, that's why we changed the, the follow-up screening according to how many polyps you had for your first screening, right? So if you have a normal colon, you have no polyps whatsoever, your repeat colonoscopy will be 10 years. If you have one to two small polyps that we remove, your repeat colonoscopy is changed to seven years and so forth. So the more polyps you have, the, the shorter the interval is. If you have more than 10 polyps, you have to go every year. So I didn't have any when I had mine done, okay. so I should be on the 10 year cycle. Yes. Right, which would then put me middle 50s. There's no reason to freak out right because like you were if saying you have polyps. if you have polyps no no it's not no, an automatic no, okay. no, no, I think a lot of men you know automatically assume you know that how yes. do you all address you know stuff like barriers like that with people so uh, I think it's about awareness and education and making it very clear. Ideally, what we're looking for is not a cancer, right? And so we're looking for a precancerous lesion that we can remove and thereby decrease your risk for cancer, right? Um, and also, I think there is a lot of mystique around the actual procedure and what actually we're doing. Patients are asleep, sedated, very comfortable and have no recollection of the procedure usually. And the procedure itself is about 12 minutes long. So once you explain all of those things, I think people become more comfortable. What I found to be very very helpful is actually to ask the patient if they can tell me what specifically about the exam makes them apprehensive about getting it. And you'd be surprised with some of the answers I get and how we can easily either give them more education or e 
then provide a scenario that might make them more comfortable. Well, Dr. Cynthia, you don't have to tell me twice because if it's going to keep me here, <laughs> right. I'm going to give me three of them. You know, <laughs> or whatever Absolutely. It is. Anyone looking for more information, Doctor, is there a website or is it even your facility? Where should people go? You sure, know? sure. So I'm in private practice. Our practice is located on 902 Quentin Road, um, Suite 701. Um, I'm on the internet um, just by my name, Cynthia Quenu. I'm on Instagram by CQ Method. Um, and those are all the ways that I can be reached. And again, the name of your practice again that we mentioned at the top was? Gastroenterology Associates of Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Okay, everybody, we're going to put the information up on our screen. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Now, from electronics to cars, there are a number of consumer guides to help you choose the best products on the market. But what if you are a member of the disabled community and you rely on these very products simply for quality of life? It's an important issue, and the USA Today Network has taken the lead on it. Joining us by Zoom now is Sarah Kovac. She's an editor with Reviewed, as well as a part of the community and a passionate advocate for inclusivity. Sarah, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Sarah. Now, explain to us, we were talking in the break, uh, just what is Reviewed? Reviewed is a product review website, and we are owned by Gannett and the USA Today Network. Um, we have headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we have a 24,000 square foot facility full of all sorts of testing apparatus. And uh, yeah, we, we review everything from refrigerators to mattresses to meal kits um, and everything in between. So if it's a product that you would research before you bought, likelihood is we've already done the work for you. Sarah, I understand you recently launched a dedicated accessibility category. Can you tell us about that one? So uh, before my current post uh, in the accessibility section, I was working with the Smart Home team as the editor, and I heard whispers about possibly us expanding into the accessibility category. And as a person with a disability myself, of course I was very excited about that because I know it's really difficult to find the right products that you need when you need them. Um, so much of the disabled community is tight knit because we have to share our little secrets with each other and share right. products that work for us. Uh, but there's really no centralized location to look for, you know, honest, hands-on reviews of products meant for the disabled community. So when Reviewed told me that we were going to launch that and gave me an opportunity to help launch it myself, uh, I was thrilled. So we started setting up the website and I, I found some freelancers and we started filling up uh, the vertical with all kinds of reviews. And it's really exciting to be able to be part of something that really hasn't existed elsewhere prior to now. All right, groundbreaking. We definitely like that, Sarah. I want to ask you because you've been so open and sharing and we talked about you being an advocate for inclusivity. What does it mean to you to have a brand like USA Today focus on the disability community? Oh, it's huge. Um, like, I, I mean, this is a brand that I'm proud to be part of regardless, but you hear so many different um, outlets and brands talking about that they care about inclusivity and um, you know, all, all the different communities that are marginalized, uh, but you rarely see them put their money where their mouth is. And in this case, you know, we are full-time uh, staffers that are dedicated just to this coverage. And, and that means a lot to me that they're willing to invest the time and money and, and people power into covering something that traditionally hasn't been covered. Absolutely, we love that. Now I want you to also talk about the inaugural Accessibility Awards and just to tell us about some of the award-winning products that got your stamp of approval. Yeah, um, at CES, we were so excited to be able to have an award ceremony on the main stage and uh, we awarded eight different products. Um, four of those products had representatives that joined us in a panel discussion on stage, but there are a couple of them that I thought were really cool. There's one called Rendever. That's a VR platform and it's full of mini games to help. Uh, it's, it's really geared towards seniors, um, but to help them stay mentally and physically fit and connected to other people. That's the whole point of this platform. And then another one I thought was really cool is called Badger. It's an ID like, like a doctor would wear that you clip on your lapel, uh, but it has a little display on it that does live speech to text. So if oh. say the doctor was working with somebody with a hearing impairment, everything that the doctor is saying is getting converted to text on their little badge so that person would be able to read what they're saying in real time. If there's one area that you would like to see more attention given, or whether it's a product or, or a service or something, if you had to think of one that you would like to see 
uh, a little bit more of a of platform of availability, what would that product be or what would that area be, Sarah? Well, this is going to probably sound like a strange answer because there is a lot of focus on it already, but um, my husband wears hearing aids and I see that there are a lot of products out there for um, the hearing impaired community, but they are all so extremely expensive. Um, and that was part of the reason that one of our other winners uh, for the Accessibility Awards was uh, Lexi. And they have created, along with Bose, um, some hearing aids that are more affordable. But generally speaking, just to be able to hear, you're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. And even then, the technology isn't perfect. So I would love, you know, that would be such a huge quality of life improvement for folks to be able to afford these and for them to work properly at all times. And I think it's only going to be something that's needed more and more as as the baby boomers age. And, then, you know, all of us wearing ear pods when we were younger have damaged our ears. So I think I think hearing is, is a pretty big deal at the moment. You certainly caught my attention when you said baby boomers. I think I'm either at the tail end of that or something <laughs> next. But anyway, sir, before you go, where can people find out more about reviewed as well as the accessibility category and any information that we want to make sure we pass along, share it with us? Well, the website is reviewed.usatoday.com and our little section is slash accessibility after that. And We've got all kinds of all kinds of different disabilities covered. And one thing I do want to mention is every bit of that that section of our website is led, edited, and written by folks in the disabled community. Awesome. So, you know, these are hands-on reviews by the people that actually use these products and speak to them um, from a disabled perspective. Sarah, thank you so much. We're going to check out Reviewed, absolutely. And thank you for pointing that out. I definitely want to make sure that gets out. And say hello to Audrey Pass for our, all of us here when you see her. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you, Antoine. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for today's show. Thank you so much for joining us. For all of us here at Fox 5, I'm Antoine Lewis. Thank you for the company. We'll see you next time for more Street Talk.